What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. Welcome back to another waiver wire edition on the channel. We are talking about the top waiver wire ads for week 12 of 2018 fantasy football. Your man's absolutely put the smack down in E-Town Get Down, but we will get into that later in the week in the E-Town Get Down Weekly recap videos which i hope you guys have been enjoying thus far let me know uh down below in the comments if you have been enjoying the e-town get down weekly recaps drop a thumbs up if you have um if you haven't i highly suggest you check those out because they're uh they're actually my favorite piece of content to make probably right now probably because i don't really have to prepare for them or anything but it's a whole nother story speaking of that we will be live streaming for tonight's game so if you're watching this monday i'm filming it at 1 50 p.m monday november 19th the most anticipated game of the year, Chiefs LA Rams, is being played tonight in LA. So, myself, Max, Nicholas, the three Etown Get Down weekly recap members, will be live streaming the game on YouTube, probably from start to finish. I think we're going to get on there probably 20 minutes before kickoff, talk about some predictions, maybe some bets we're laying down, eat some food, drink some drinks, probably fill up on the margs because you know what season it is. Uh, so make sure you got the notifications turned on for my channel, and that will let you know when we go live. So it should be fun. Uh, other quick updates on the channel. I ordered a few new cords, so hopefully from now on when I'm live streaming, I could actually, the feed that you'll be watching, not my shitty laptop camera, it's going to be from my actual camera that I film with. So the streams will be much higher quality. And we got a couple new lav mics for you guys that, you know, you said you couldn't still hear the audio really on our E-Town Get Down Weekly Recaps. So... Hopefully the audio will be better, the video will be better. We just continuously upgrade the production value. That's not why you're here though. You're here for waiver wire videos. You're here for the breakdown of quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, tight ends, and of course my streaming defenses of the week. Everybody named in this video is owned in 55% or fewer of Yahoo leagues. Let's get cracking. <laughs> The only guy I would say that is going to possibly make this list um, before the Monday night games would be Josh Reynolds. The wide receiver is going to take over Cooper Cup spot. Well, he'll be on the outside. Robert Woods will be running in the slot from now on. He is uh, only owned in 43% of leagues, so I have a feeling after tonight's game, there's a good chance that he would have been on this list, but uh, that's that. Quarterbacks. Numero uno, obviously the one guy that is going to be the most prized possession on the waiver wire this week is Lamar Jackson. Baltimore Ravens, rookie, first round pick, 18% owned, highly, 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 highly available, made his first start on Sunday, and Jackson had 27 rush attempts. You're getting a high volume RB1 in your quarterback spot. If only he could throw for a little more uh, production and yardage, that would be fantastic, but I think that will come in time. If you check out this field, Yates tweet, 27 rush attempts. No quarterback has had 25 or more rushing attempts since at least 1999. Uh, and I believe that these 27 attempts were the highest of a quarterback in the last 65 years and the most ever in, obviously, uh, their first game. He rushed for 117 yards on those 27 attempts, which is the first time since November 27th, 2016, that a quarterback has topped 100 rushing yards in a game. That was from your man's Colin Kaepernick back in 2016. Interesting stat right there. He's also the first quarterback in Super Bowl era to rush for 100 yards in his first career start. Okay, I'm done with the fun facts, I promise. Um, but he did not find the end zone at all, unfortunately. He threw for 150 yards. He threw an interception as well. But the 117 yards is such a high floor, guys. And to be honest, this is not an outlier of a game for him. This is what he did all throughout college. He averaged like 108 rushing yards a game throughout college. And I don't think... I think going forward, if he remains the starter... He's going to give you 70 to 80 rushing yards a game because you clearly see what their game plan is going to be with Jackson on the field. And he's just that type of player. And that's what he does. And that's what he brings to the game. And the Ravens obviously knew that when they drafted him, they're not going to try to turn him into a Peyton Manning or a Drew Brees or anything like that. They're going to use Lamar Jackson's skill set exactly how we saw on Sunday. And like I said, that floor is good, but we're going to start seeing breakaway touchdowns. If he is the quarterback for the rest of the season and he's going to get, even if it's 10 10 to 15 rushing attempts a game, eventually he's going to break a few of those off. And he's going to give you, you know, 11 fantasy points on a single play. 
And that's going to happen multiple times, I bet. So he gets a great matchup at home in week 12, where he'll be a low-end QB1 with, you know, high-end quarterback one upside for this matchup. Um, it's going to depend a lot on Flacco's health. And from what I've heard so far from, from you know, reports and, and Harbaugh or whatever after the game, it's he's not entirely optimistic about Flacco being ready. I do think that, you know, this, this win, this, you know, being able to rally around Lamar Jackson and just having Oakland on the schedule next – Gives probably him more time to rest Flacco if need be, even if he wants to bring him back. So he gets Oakland, Atlanta, Kansas City, all games in which you can attack. Lamar Jackson is uh, needs to be owned in all leagues, especially Superflex leagues, of course. Second guy on this list, which also needs to be owned in probably all leagues and, of course, all Superflex leagues, Jameis Winston, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, 9% owned. Everyone was yelling at me last week when I was like, you should get Winston now and be ahead of the curve because Fitzpatrick is not going to keep up good play for six weeks to end the season. And Fitzpatrick, as he always is and will continue to be if he ever gets back in the starting lineup, is going to be on a ridiculously short leash. Three interceptions, which he threw on Sunday, is the kind of leash that's going to get you yanked out of the game. Um, So Winston came in the second half and almost led a comeback drive against the Giants. He threw for nearly, I think it was 199 yards, so almost 200 yards, two touchdowns. He did throw a pick, but that comes with the territory of starting Jameis Winston. You don't really care about the turnovers because the high volume of yardage and hopefully touchdown scores, is what offsets all of that. And he has literally overall QB1 weekly upside. The first game back he had this year in 2018, he was quarterback one in fantasy. So that being said, um, he is a a great pickup in Superflex leagues, and you need to get him back on your roster now. I don't think they've announced who's going to be the starter next week, but I would have to imagine it's going to be Jameis Winston. They're going to be out of the playoffs. I think they're three and seven. So you have to see what you have in the future and Jameis Winston, maybe they give him one, you know, they're going to give him one more ride. They're going to, they're going to let this play out and see what happens um, over the last six weeks of the season. And maybe Jameis Winston will, you know, show them some hope. And uh, I don't know. I think we're still pretty early on this kid to just judge him because he is so young compared to the other players that are hitting their prime and their peak, right? Like all, all of the, the established quarterbacks are like 30 years old or much older than that. So to just be like Winston is not the quarterback of the future when he's 25 years old, I think is a little bit ridiculous. So you need to pick up Winston. He's got three home games in a row. San Francisco, Carolina, New Orleans, all games in which I think Winston could produce quarterback one numbers in fantasy. So go grab Winston. Uh, a few guys whose names have kind of jumped on and off of the waiver wire list for quarterbacks throughout the year. And would be, you know, usable streaming options in week 12 would be Dak Prescott, 48% owned. He had a pretty disappointing day considering he was playing against Atlanta. Um, But he takes on the Redskins at home in week 12, who kind of held Deshaun Watson in check. And they've been like a pretty decent defense overall. But prior to Deshaun Watson's game, they've allowed 300 yard, 300 passing yards to three straight quarterbacks. Before that, I think just not having Alex Smith anymore is going to really deplete that team. And they are not going to move the ball on offense, which in turn hurts the defense. So I think Dak is good. Uh, and I think Baker Mayfield, 41% owned, is another good streaming option. He's coming off of a bye, and he's also coming off his best fantasy game of the year prior to the bye in Week 10, where he threw for three touchdowns, no interceptions, 215 passing yards. He gets a gorgeous matchup against Cincinnati in Week 12. Um, so those are my top streaming options at quarterback. Running backs get more interesting. We have a few names on this list where it's not, you know, your typical waiver wire okay, someone got injured or blah, blah, blah. We have some guys with some some pretty good upside. And the first guy on this list is Josh Adams of the Philadelphia Eagles, owned in 32% of Yahoo leagues. I actually just dropped him prior to the game in my E-Town Get Down League. And uh, I needed a, a quarterback for next week because Patrick Mahomes is on a bye. But I already have, actually, I probably could have needed him because I have Karen Johnson who just got hurt, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Anyways, this is one of the more intriguing storylines. This was one of the more intriguing story. Uh, storylines heading into week 11 not only just the Eagles Saints game but the Eagles backfield overall um, Adams has impressed in recent weeks and you know we we heard these reports about how he's promised more work and they were going to get him more involved and uh, and and they did to a point right he got seven carries turned that into 53 yards which is 7.6 yards per carry he had a really nice 28 yard touchdown run in this one in the second quarter seven carries was about on par with what we saw from week 10, he had seven carries, um, and it was actually two fewer than in week nine. But when you're looking at the backfield as a whole, what happened in week 11, he handled all but three carries to running backs and two targets between Clement and Smallwood. So he had way more work than the rest of the backfield. So you can't look at this as just an overall volume thing. You have to look at it relative to the other backs. And that was a good sign for Josh Adams. It was also the first time that he led the backfield in snaps. He saw 28 of the offensive snaps. Uh, Clement saw 14 and Smallwood saw 
four. So Smallwood is almost phased out of the game, and it looks like Adams is backfield going forward. Now, Adams has an interesting backstory, I guess, right? He was an undrafted free agent. He wasn't healthy enough to participate in OTAs or minicamp, uh, which is obviously a huge piece of trying to make the team when you are an undrafted free agent. So he was cut after the preseason. He didn't have enough time to really show them what he was about. He eventually signed back onto the Eagles squad and was promoted to the active roster just a couple weeks ago. And since then, over the last three weeks, he has racked up 161 rushing yards on 23 carries. So seven yards per carry. And this is his player profiler profile for Josh Adams. Uh, nothing really stands out. As you can see, he's a big, he's a bigger back, right? 6'2", 215 ish So he's kind of got that workhorse build. When you see him play, when you see him on the field, you're like, okay, yeah, he does actually kind of look like a workhorse. Um, that high, high agility score is good to see. But nothing else really stands out. But he did show that he can catch the ball an 8% target share in college, which is 55th percentile. And uh, coming into Sunday, Adams had just a single target on the entire year. But he finished second on the team on Sunday with six targets. He caught three of them. It uh, wasn't a big pr- part of his production or anything, but it was really good to see him involved with six targets and being the second highest targeted player on the team. Uh, I mean, the game script was obviously a big piece of that because when you have the Taints, <laughs> I was about to say the Saints tearing a new one into the Eagles, I guess their Taint, you know, that actually kind of works into this because they, they stretched him out a little bit down there if you want to put it that way. 48 to 7. That obviously worked itself into the game script, the way that Josh Adams was used into the passing game. It was good to see how heavily he was used in respect to the other running backs in Philadelphia. Still, though, still, I think there is a reason to worry. I don't think there's a reason to be super optimistic about it. The low volume overall is not something that, you know, gets you excited because this is an Eagles backfield where the leading, you know, rusher does not normally get that many carries in a given game. And it's just kind of a carousel of who's going to be getting carries this week, who's going to be getting targets this week. And I think that's what we're going to continue seeing moving forward. Although Josh Adams is obviously the back to own in this backfield. Um, I don't think I could start him as anything more than, than a than a flex play in week 12. He plays the Giants at home. End of the day, he has really, really good yards per carry number, but it's a ridiculously low sample size, and I don't want to buy in just on that. Although the, the upside is certainly here, so I'm not going to blow my, my fab budget on him, um, but somewhere between you know the 8 and 15% range is cool with me. If you are in need of a running back, Second on this list is Theo Riddick of the Detroit Lions. Now, the obvious news is Karen Johnson left the field with a knee injury. We've uh, since heard that it is a sprained knee, and he is week to week. He's almost certainly going to miss Thursday's game because they play at thanks- um, on Thanksgiving, which sucks because I'm a Karen Johnson owner. Kind of needed his ass. He was killing. He was killing the Panthers on Sunday, and he would have had a much bigger game. Um, but now he's going to be out for one week, probably two weeks. Hopefully not three weeks, but this obviously opens up the work in the backfield for uh, the Detroit Lions, and Riddick is the pass catcher there, and, you know, Karen Johnson's actually been getting a lot of work out of the backfield. Since Golden Tate has left Detroit, uh, Riddick has run a pass route on 60% of Matthew Stafford's dropbacks, and he has seen at least seven targets and caught at least five balls in every game since then. Uh, what I will say is Bruce Ellington coming back, and I'm going to cover him in the uh, in the in the wide receiver section of this. Was someone that scared me as soon as I saw his name pop up that he was on the active roster and he was going to be playing slot. I was like, oh shit, this is a downgrade to Theo Riddick. He's an underrated slot receiver, and again, I'll get into that later. But um, you know, since Karen Johnson is out, you got to own Riddick. You got to pick up Riddick. He's not necessarily someone I'm excited about putting into my lineup, but I'm sure a lot of people at this point could probably use running backs. They do play Chicago on Thanksgiving. So that's a really, really, really tough matchup. We saw Minnesota running backs get absolutely fucking destroyed. Like Dalvin Cook put up half a point, I think. Um, And he's a good pass catcher. So I'm not excited about the Riddick. I think he needs to be looked at as a lower flex play, even in full PPR leagues. After that, they get the, the Rams and then they're at Arizona. Um, hopefully, Karen Johnson will be back by then to play the worst run defense in the NFL. Third on this list, another intriguing name is this guy, Gus Edwards. I have a lot of notes on him, so stay with me, people. Gus Edwards, Baltimore Ravens, owned in 3% of Yahoo Leagues. Um, and I think it's important for me to break this down so you know more than just names and numbers when it comes to this kid. And I can give you a little background, so we're going to break it down like a like a shotgun here, right? Edwards is an undrafted free agent, came out of Rutgers, shout out New Jersey, shout out Rutgers, let's go. He entered the game with 64 rushing yards and 15 carries on the season, aka in his career in the NFL. 
He finished Sunday with 115 rushing yards on 17 carries and a touchdown. He did have zero targets on the day, though. Um, now, we're looking at his player profiler. Profile, he's a big back. He's a bruiser. 6'1", about 230 pounds. Good-ish speed uh, for his size. 78th percentile speed score, uh, weight adjusted speed score. His best comparable player is Jonathan Williams on player profiler. Uh, and honestly, I, so I went back and I, I missed the afternoon games because I was, uh, this even an afternoon game? I don't know. I missed this game. So I rewatched the Ravens game this morning on, on Game Pass. And Gus actually reminded me of a poor man's, a mix between like Jordan Howard and Chris Carson. Both big, right? They're both big and they, they kind of succeed inside the lanes, but they're kind of shifty and they're kind of bruisers just because of their size. That's kind of what Gus reminded me of, a poor man's version of them. So definitely not as good as them, but similar running style, I would say. Gus Edwards is a huge hit to Alex Collins. Anyone who owns Alex Collins, I think he's going to become droppable within the next few weeks in fantasy football. And Collins took a backseat to Edwards in this game, like almost completely, as did all of the Ravens' backfield, uh, because Edwards saw 49 snaps in this one out of the backfield. Collins had just 17. Ty Montgomery was active for the first time, saw just nine snaps. Buck Allen finally phased out five snaps. Uh, and the com- concerning part was like, it wasn't like Collins was benched for a fumble. It wasn't like he did something wrong, like he missed a, a pass block. It wasn't like he was disciplinary or a game script made him come out of the game. Because uh, Collins had a nice touchdown run on the first drive, and then Gus Edwards was just used thereafter. And he was used on the first drive as well. And he started the second half of the game while the game was tied, so again, it wasn't game script related. The most important part, though, that you need to take away here is that this was um, coming off of a bye week, too. So you're coming off of a bye week, right, with Lamar Jackson getting ready for this. This tells you that the fact that Gus Edwards was used on the first drive as well as throughout the entire game means they had planned him to be part of the game plan coming into this one. It wasn't, like I said, something random that happened that needed to put Collins on the bench for. So Edwards was clearly part of the game plan here. And I think Edwards is probably the back to own in Baltimore going forward now because they're going to see what they have with him. What I will say, though, uh, is a few things. Harbaugh said of Edwards' bruising style after the game, and this is a quote, he gives us that back that we probably didn't have earlier in the year. We've got four different guys who have different styles. I think that's a plus for us. So you hear four different backs, and that's like a fucking fantasy owner's worst nightmare when it comes to owning one of those running backs, right? You have Collins, who's more of like a shiftier guy but can still run inside the tackles. You have the bruiser, Edwards, who's 230 pounds. You have the pass catcher in timeout, and then you have Suck Allen, who's pretty much just a combination of all of the worst parts of all three of those backs, and finally he's getting phased out of the offense. So thank you, Baltimore, for that, for not having to give me any more anxiety talking about Buck Allen for the rest of my life, hopefully. Um, so you basically, you have a committee, a full-blown committee. And I do think, like I said, this makes Gus Edwards the back to own in Baltimore going forward. What I saw on tape was this. Like, he is a running back that you absolutely cannot tackle with one arm. Like, if he's getting through the hole and you have a defender that tries to, like, grab him with one arm because they're getting blocked or whatever, you are not getting him down to the ground. Um, so he's a tough guy to bring down to the ground, first of all. He will run through soft tackles, uh, but he kind of, he looks mediocre a lot of the time. He had some really good runs where he looked shifting and he was breaking tackles, but I would say more often than not, he just had kind of like, you know, hit the hole, fall down. He had those kind of runs. So I, I, I don't know. It, it, it's a balance between power and shiftiness. I will say though, they were playing against the Bengals, right? Horrible, horrible defense right now. They are 29th in tackling per PFF. Their, their defense is horrible at tackling. So it makes sense that Gus Edwards was Extremely hard for the Bengals to bring down in this one. Uh, luckily for Edwards and the Ravens, overall, they play Oakland next week, um, who is 28th ranked in tackling per PFF. So Edwards could be inserted into your lineup, I think, as a flex play, most likely. Um, if you can get him on your wire, I would certainly do so. I think he's the guy to own over Alex Collins. He gets Oakland, he gets Atlanta, he gets Kansas City over the next three. All very, very, very friendly backfields to, or defenses to running backs. Oakland is the seventh friendliest Defense to fantasy running backs, Atlanta the second most, and Kansas City the single friendliest one. Um, and that's it for the running backs that I really like. Uh, with carry on out, I mean, if you want to grab LeGarrette Blunt, I, I'm i actually not going to say I don't blame you. I do blame you. That's probably a horrible pickup, and I think he's horrible. And when I watch him play, it makes me angry that he has more than zero snaps on a given day because I see him like run to the outside. He'll gain three yards, but if carry on Johnson had been in the game for that run, there was like a quick cutback that he would have had and probably gained 12 yards. And I saw that like multiple times throughout the game when Blunt was in. So that's a whole other story. I'm probably not picking up Blunt unless I'm super, super, super desperate. I highly doubt he gets anything going against the Chicago Bears this week. 
Um, but yeah, that's the running backs. I want to say thank you to today's sponsors of the video. We got FantasyJocks.com, the industry leader in um, fantasy equipment for your fantasy league. Whether it's fantasy football, basketball, baseball, it doesn't matter. They got everything. Everything. Check out their website, FantasyJocks.com. Use promo code TAKE10 or Taco Corp for 10% off your purchase. TAKE10. It's TAKE and then the number 10. 10% off your purchase. Uh, have everyone chip in a few dollars and you can get yourself a belt. You can get yourself a ring. Make sure you crown your champion this fall, this winter. When is this? I guess, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's definitely in the winter. Actually, isn't December, December 21st is the first day of winter, isn't it? So technically, your fantasy championships, what is this, week 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, oh yeah, you're right, okay, 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 so it will be, it will be winter, so crown your goddamn champion this winter, with some gear from fantasyjocks.com, check them out, your boy sent you, thank y'all for sponsoring the video, love y'all, let's get to the wide receivers, first up on this list, Anthony Miller of the Chicago Bears, the Bears, the Bears, the Bears, the Bears, 42% owned, all this man does is, is is score tutties, man. I mean, Miller scored again on Sunday, which makes it his fifth touchdown on the year and third touchdown in the last four games. He only caught two passes for 25 yards. Disappointing. But getting in the end zone saves you, right? That gives him that double-digit PPR game. Um, Trubisky was bad yesterday, as I had predicted, as soon as he was playing against an actual defense outside of, like, Tampa Bay in these horrible defenses he's been playing with or against for a while, uh, I thought we were going to see more of Trubisky's true colors as a passer, and we did. Luckily for him, though, and Miller, they play against Detroit on Thanksgiving, which I feel like I've gone over 48 times already this this video, um, and Detroit is far from a good pass defense. Uh, Miller, who runs the majority of his routes from the slot, gets a Lions team that just got eviscerated. I am not only upgrading my production quality, but I'm upgrading my vocabulary vocabulary quality. Yeah, I almost said that wrong. That would have been that would have been quite the ire I Okay, we're going to we're going to stick to fantasy football stats. Now, I don't have the numbers on how much of DJ Moore's production came out of the slot, and I'm going to check it for you real quick while I keep talking. But I would think that it was uh, at least a, a decent portion of like the 150 yards or whatever he ended up uh, having came out of the slot. So that is good news for Anthony Miller. That is good news for the Bears passing game overall because Detroit is far from strong against the pass. And I think Trubisky needs um, a, a weak passing defense in order to really pad his Fantasy stats. Okay, so... Uh, nope, I guess DJ Moore didn't really run too much in the slot. But... Whatever. That's neither here nor here. Um, Anthony Miller, again, good matchup. Uh, I, I like Miller's consistency. He's been com involved in the offense week over week over week. Detroit, New York Giants, Carolina. No matchups to shy away from over the next few weeks. Go grab Anthony Miller if you need a wide receiver. Another rookie wide receiver on this list, DJ Moore, who I just spoke about, Carolina Panthers, 39% owned. This rookie class is, they are just Millie rocking all over 2018, man. And it was just about time that we had a rookie class kind of bounce out. And I was not surprised that it was this one because there's a lot of talent in this draft class. Now, we don't see like the Julio Jones type of player yet. At least we haven't seen any of those guys emerge. There was a lot of really solid wide receivers. DJ Moore has has been one of them. And he has turned into pretty much a full-time player over the last month or so, and he's playing on like 80% of the snaps. He was their first-round pick, and he showed on Sunday exactly why that was the case. He caught seven of eight targets, 157 yards, and a tug. Uh, he just missed scoring twice. He was tackled inside the five-yard line, so it could have been even a much bigger day. I would much rather own DJ Moore than Devin Funches for the rest of the season going forward. And, uh, you know, it's nice as a fantasy owner because Devin Funches is probably still going to see the top cornerback on the opposing defense. And DJ Moore probably will not, especially since they move him around a lot. So that's a good thing for Moore. That being said, though, that being said, um, actually, hold on one sec. Let me pull this out so this thing don't overheat or nothing. DJ Moore has had two really big games over his last four, but he's also sandwiched those two big games with two really bad games in week nine and 10. And it's not like his playtime suddenly went up in week 11, and that's where you can uh, you know attribute his bad play to his good play. It was just inconsistency there. 
And I think that's, uh, I mean, from a production standpoint, and I think that's what we are probably going to have to expect going forward. Now, you know, DJ Moore, the last time he had that big game, everyone was really, really high on him against uh, uh, for the next week, right? We're like, oh, if Torrey Smith is out, DJ Moore is a must-play in, in GPP and DFS or whatever. And then he disappointed again. So I don't want that to, to, to be the case again. So I think people need to kind of temper their expectations. Um, but he does have three exploitable matchups in a row. So Moore could end up establishing himself as a fantasy wide receiver two or three down the stretch. And they have one of the easiest second-half passing schedules in the NFL, uh, they play Seattle at home next week. They play at Tampa Bay and then at Cleveland. All games in which you could probably start more in your flexi sexy. So, DJ Moore is number two on the list. Um, number three on this list, Kiki Cutie, Houston Texans. 30% owned, and I wish I had pushed Cutie harder because I had, li- I had liked him all year. And then, like, I don't know, I guess I just kind of got off him once they traded for Demarius Thomas. And then they said he was a little banged up, even though I liked Cutie more than Demarius Thomas. I don't know. I wish I had pushed him to you guys harder. Because I I knew like it was it was something I knew that I liked more, but for some reason I just went with the with the the consensus and it kind of pushed me away from my own opinion. But QT is the wide receiver two here to own in uh, in Houston. It is not Demarius Thomas, and you know despite being limited all week with this hammy injury that we were hearing about co- uh, constantly, he showed up and there was no sign of that hammy slowing him down at all. He saw a team high nine targets on Sunday, seventy seven yards. He tied D Hop with. Uh, five receptions. So he led the team in targets and yards, and he tied DeAndre Hopkins with five receptions on the day. Demarius Thomas saw just one target on the day. So you're looking at QD, who has played in three full games on the season, and in those games, he has seen 15, 7, and 9 targets. He's clearly going to be a big part of this offense and this passing game going forward. Uh, He will be a high-floor PPR play for the rest of the season, and he brings some upside because I think Deshaun Watson will have those games where he throws for three, four passing touchdowns. Um, And now he gets three home games in a row, which is always good for the passing offense, and is Tennessee, Cleveland, Indy. No games in which I am nervous about playing my mans. Um, Fourth up on this list, and last of the guys that I really like, is Traquan Smith, New Orleans Saints. Another guy that I wish I didn't really get away from, even though I did tell some people to play him um, in in, uh, some of the questions that I had gotten. But he was largely dropped because he had been really bad from a production standpoint over the last couple weeks. He, uh, you know, he went bonkers in this one. He kind of did his best Michael Thomas impression. Michael Thomas was the second best Saints receiver on the field on Sunday. It was a weird game, though, because Ingram and Alvin Kamara combined for one target on the day, which is crazy. Um, Traquan caught 10 of 13 targets for 157 yards and a score. Like I said, though, he had been so bad from a production standpoint from the last three weeks that there was almost no chance that you had him in your lineup and he was being overlooked, right? The fact of the matter remains that he is the wide receiver two in a Drew Brees, Drew Brees offense that's throwing up like 40 to 45 points per game. And they were playing against the Eagles secondary who has zero cornerbacks um, on the field. Like that was really all you needed to say. And like I said, it was a weird game in the fact that there was no targets thrown to the running back when up from like weeks one to 10, they had seen like 31% of Brees' targets. So I don't expect expect Smith to kind of blow up right now. But it's definitely good to see this type of upside. And we know, you know, you could feel a little bit more comfortable with Breeze giving him 13 targets and really exploiting that matchup. So that was good to see. He also gets three really, really, really good matchups going forward. He gets Atlanta next week at home. Then he's at Dallas and then uh, at home against Tampa Bay. So two horrible pass defenses over the next three weeks. At Dallas, not that scary since Michael Thomas will take... um, the top cornerback on the Cowboys. So Traycon will be, he'll be left to just kind of run amok on that Cowboys secondary. And those are the top four uh, wide receivers I like on the free agent wire this week. Um, three or four of them are rookies. There's a couple other guys that I just want to throw the names out there that I think you guys could probably use if you're in a deeper league or whatever reason. I'm just going to tell y'all who I like. It's another rookie, Marquez Valdez-Scantling, MVS of the Packers. And I think a lot of people probably dropped him after Thursday night or even prior to that. But you got to pick him back up. Jimmy Graham just got hurt. He's going to miss multiple weeks. Randall Cobb is probably not close to returning. Ty Mont's out of the picture. Someone's got to get the ball besides Jones and Adams. I think. Maybe not. I don't know. They could probably actually run a pretty goddamn good offense with just those two on the field. But MVS will have his time and his place, I think, just like Traquan. The wide receiver two in the Drew Brees offense. Marquez is moving towards that spot in deeper, deeper leagues. Equinemia St. Brown becomes semi-intriguing, but I, I'd much rather have MBS, of course. Um, Bruce Ellington, as I said, when I saw his name pop up on the active roster list, I was like, oh, shit. 
Bruce might have some impact going down the stretch. Um, in week one of my top DFS plays video, all the way back in September, Bruce Ellington was my favorite play owned in less than 5% of leagues because he was the slot wide receiver for the Texans in week one while um, Kiki Kuki was dealing with a hamstring injury and Bruce Ellington did not disappoint. He got into the end zone that game. He saw a lot of targets, blah, blah, blah. Now he is in a good position to succeed in Detroit where he's taking over as a slot receiver for Golden Tate who left 27% of the team's targets when he de- when he went over to, uh, to the Eagles. And uh, as soon as I saw that, right, I got a little bit nervous about Riddick um, and Marvin Jones doesn't seem like he's kind of close to playing. Um, so it's like, Ellington might be a weapon just kind of by default. No Marvin Jones, no more Golden Tate. Um, Karen Johnson is now hurt, so they're going to have to use him. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see. And I think Ellington brings more upside and floor than people uh, realize. He had nine targets on Sunday. Only Kenny Galladay had more than that. And they're going to have to rely on the pass without Karen Johnson in. So I like Ellington. Dontrell Inman is another name to keep on your wire. He's on the Colts. You guys probably didn't even know that. Um, he caught a few balls on Sunday, uh, four passes, 34 yards, and a touchdown. He's actually settling in as the wide receiver, two for Andrew Luck behind T.Y. Hilton. He had more snaps than Ryan Grant. He had more snaps than Chester Rogers. He's starting to do something with those snaps, and he's starting to actually produce. And, you know, Andrew Luck has been ridiculous this year. That Colts offense has been ridiculous this year. There are worse positions to be in than the wide receiver, two in an Andrew Luck offense. He had uh, 20.5% target share on Sunday as well. So if his role grows... Um, there's a ton of upside there for Dontrell Inman, and there's been like raving reviews. Supposedly, he's been looked really, really good at practice and stuff. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, and they get Miami in Week 12, so great matchup there. If he explodes there, then you know he might be for real. Trey Quinn is the last name on this list, and uh, he was finally activated on Sunday. He was their seventh round pick, I believe, for the Redskins. And uh, I told y'all, if y'all joined me for the live stream prior to kickoff, I was like, guys, if you're in a dynasty league. Grab Trey Quinn before kickoff if he is available because he is going to be the slot receiver for the Redskins going forward. And that would push Maurice Harris to the outside, making Maurice Harris droppable because he's not good enough to succeed on the outside as a wide receiver, especially not with Colt McCoy now under center, um, which is realistically a downgrade for all of the pass catchers in this offense. And Quinn didn't really do anything spectacular on Sunday. But he did lead all Redskins receivers with 49 receiving yards. Caught all four of his targets. He's going to be the slot wide receiver. And I like any slot wide receiver that is getting a ton of looks. So Trey Quinn's just a name to keep an eye on. Let's move over to the tight end position. First guy on this list. And really the only guy I'm excited about picking up if I need a tight end is Cameron Brait. 20% owned. And the reason for this is OJ Howard left the game at the end of the game with an ankle injury. Which fucking sucks. Because in the E-Town Get Down League, right? I'm playing whoever, the ninth or 10th place person. I'm like, oh, there's no way I'm going to lose. Then I look at my my roster next week. I have Travis Kelsey on a bye. I have Patrick Mahomes on a bye. I have Robert Woods on a bye. Now I have Karen Johnson very likely out. OJ Howard probably out. So I got like five five of my best players that I can't even use. So now I'm a little now I'm a little worried. And I'm a little worried about OJ Howard because he left late in the game. And this game was still very much in hand. They could have come back and won. And that tells you normally players will play through you know minor injuries if they think they can help their team win. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't think he could play through that. So that's probably a little bit more serious than we know. I'm not sure what the injury status is as of right now. I haven't heard anything. So maybe you guys hear something within the next couple of days that you know changes this analysis. But the Bucks offense is very much like the Colts offense in the sense that um, you know they run through the tight end, especially when Winston is under center. And I expect him to be under center going forward. Um, and if there's ever one tight end that's on the field, we saw it with Eric Ebron, we see it with Cameron Brait, we see it with OJ Howard. If there's ever one tight end on the field with either of those offenses, they always produce like a locked in tight end one. Um, they get three great matchups in a row. They play San Francisco, Carolina, New Orleans, all at home. New Orleans is actually a horrible matchup for tight ends. Excuse me for saying that, but Carolina has allowed the single most fantasy points to the tight end position this year. So that's an incredible matchup. Hopefully Howard is back by then. And uh, I actually found this picture of the O.J. Howard injury that happened on Sunday. So I'm going to give you a heads up. It's not really that gruesome, to be honest with you. But if you don't like injury pictures, I'm going to say you should look away within the next three seconds. I'll let you know when you can look again. But I'm about to put the picture up on the screen. And you can see on the bottom where his ankle gets twisted underneath the Giants player. So I, you know, I'm a doctor. And I could tell you... Nah, I'm just fucking with you. I don't know what I don't know what that means in terms of his injury status, but we'll hear something soon. Doesn't look great based on that picture. Um, 
So if you're an OJ Howard owner or a Travis Kelsey owner who's on a buy next week, Cameron Bray is your top guy. Uh, a couple other guys that intrigue me sort of is Jonu Smith of the Titans. Actually, he would have intrigued me because um, he scored double-digit PPR fantasy points in three straight games. He saw a season-high eight targets, had a season-high six catches on Sunday. Super athlete, but Mariota re-injured his throwing elbow, and his status is obviously in doubt for week 12. You don't want to stream anybody that is tethered to Blaine Gabbard at quarterback, of course. Uh, I don't hate Chris Herndon of the Jets. If you're really desperate, he's coming off the bye, and they take on the Patriots in week 12 at home, and the Patriots have allowed the fourth most fantasy points to the tight end position on the year. Herndon has become the clear-cut pass-catching tight end in this New York Jets offense. Um... Not something to be very excited about, but again, people are desperate, so I want to lay out all possible options. Last guy on this list. <sighs> With Jimmy Graham out of the picture in Green Bay, right? It's, it's a situation where we have to keep an eye on which tight end is going to emerge in Green Bay. We saw this big white guy come in on Thursday Night Football and catch a long touchdown pass from Aaron Rodgers. This guy's name is Robert Tanyan. And if you look at his player profiler page, this guy is an athlete. He is, you know, 65th percentile or above in every category there. 40-yard dash, speed score, burst score, agility, catch radius. Uh, really fast for a guy who is 6'5 and 235. He had a breakout age of the 74th percentile, college dominator, 97th percentile, which means as a tight end, he might have, maybe he played wide receiver and converted over a tight end. I didn't actually look that deep into it, but that that would make sense um, given his size and given the college dominator, which is basically the percentage of your team's um, like receiving yards and receptions and touchdowns that you had. And having 38% of that is a huge, huge, huge number. So we might have something here. We might also not have something here because he actually literally ran two routes in that game. One of them happened to be that deep touchdown. So we'll have to see a major uptick in terms of like snaps to feel anywhere near good for this guy, but I'm just letting you know you should put him on your radar and he could emerge for someone uh, in Green Bay's offense down the stretch. Those are the tight ends for you. Uh, and as always, you know, we jump into the defensive streams of the week and I'm just going to pull up this tweet I put out earlier today. If you ain't following me on Twitter, make sure you're doing that. Um, so an early look at my top streaming options. As the week goes by, some things change depending on quarterback statuses and whatnot, but just looking at the early lines for next week. New Orleans is a very good stream. Uh, I put them as a good stream this week against the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, and a lot of people were a little questionable about that. And it's pretty much the exact same outlook against Atlanta. Um, New Orleans is actually way more heavily favored in this one. Uh, the over-under is a little high, but it was it was high in the game against the Eagles as well. They're huge favorites. They are at home. Um, so I like New Orleans at home. Their defense has been much, much, much better as of late. And they look like a really just... A, you know, they're almost like an elite defense right now. Another defense I like is the Colts, 26% owned. They will be playing at home against the Dolphins. We don't know who's going to be the quarterback for Miami, whether it's going to be Tannehill or Osweiler. They're almost 10-point favorites, uh, 50 point over under. So I really like the Colts as well as a stream. Um, hopefully they have Malik Hooker back for that game. Last on this list is Dallas, and they're probably my favorite stream of the week. They are only 17% owned, so they're probably highly available in your leagues. They're playing against the Redskins at home. Seven and a half point favorites, 40 and a half point over under. I love that. And Alex Smith is obviously gone for the year, RIP to the Smythe guy. Colt McCoy is going to be taking over the quarterback. Anytime you could stream against a second string quarterback is good when you could do it as a favorite at home. Mwah. Dallas would probably be my favorite streaming option. New Orleans is a very, very close second there. Those are my top streaming options. Those are my top waiver wire picks for this week. And just a reminder, we will be live streaming tonight's game, Monday Night Football, Chiefs versus Rams. Your boys are going to be live streaming commentary, whatever. You want to shut off all those st stupid-ass announcers that ESPN uses, listen to your mans. Probably the best idea I've ever given you. So make sure you got notifications turned on for the channel. We will go live probably around 8 o'clock if kickoff's like 8.20, 8.30. Stay tuned for that. Uh, make sure you thumbs up the video if you enjoyed. If you found it valuable, lets me know that you enjoyed and found it valuable. Thus, I will keep making them for you. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Check me out on patreon.com slash bdge if you are interested in getting my weekly rankings. If you are interested in a private live stream that I do every Wednesday night with my patrons only. If you are interested in a community in which you ask questions and we all 
answer them because I can't get to all my social media questions, but I get to almost every question on Patreon. So patreon.com slash BDGE. Check me out on there. Check out fantasyjocks.com. And that's it. So I'll see y'all on Thursday. Actually, tonight, but Thursday after that. Peace.